Well, this morning we're looking again at the Lord's Prayer, the most well-known passage of Scripture in all the world, the one that almost two billion people have memorized and can stay. And about three weeks ago, I showed you that there are seven parts to that prayer, seven elements, seven petitions, as it were. Uh, Jesus commanded that the Lord's Prayer be the manner in which we pray, not the words which we pray, but the manner. So it's, it's like a framework. And so we looked at the first element, which was our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that is a pause. If you think about it, the Lord's Prayer starts with pausing. Pausing and looking at the one to whom we're addressing our prayer, the one that we're approaching. And, and when we pause, it's, it's me asking the Lord to focus me on who I'm talking to, who my Father is, what what it is that I reflect on, his attributes, his character, his changeless being, that has invited me to be in his family, invited me to be his child, and he's my father. So that focus me is really just a pause. Then the first petition is thy kingdom come. And last week we looked at that. I told you Martin Luther, I love it, called it the terrible petition. It's the petition where we invite God's control. Uh, last fall, Bonnie and I went down to Sturgis or Niles, wherever the Life Action, or Buchanan, I'm not sure where it is, but it's south of here, where the Life Action Ministry headquarters is. And we had an incredible evening dinner with the director down there and also Tim and Sue Johnson, who were serving down there. And, and during the dinner, the director was telling me something that I wish I would have thought of when I was a youth pastor back in the old days. Uh, he said that when he speaks all over the country, that, that sometimes he brings with him hundreds of pieces of chalk, you know, like chalkboard chalk. And, and while he's ministering there, he puts them across the front. And then he, in his message, invites the people at the end of the service, if they want to, to come up and get a little piece of chalk and to go out as, as soon as they leave the building before they get in their car and to stand by the car and to draw a circle in the parking lot and then to step inside the circle that they've drawn and right there to say, God of the universe, I don't really control much around here, but everything inside this circle, I'm just giving to you and asking you to take and use and control my life. And so the, the Life Action team does all their thing and when the service is all over and they get all done, and he said one of the great moments for him is to walk outside and to look at those parking lots, you know, if they're huge, just acres of parking lots, and see all those circles. And to think that all over, wherever he's speaking, people are going back to school and their jobs and their homes and their communities, and they have said, Lord, control me. You are my master, and I want to do your will. So that's the second petition, thy kingdom come. And that's where we got last week, and we looked at, I mean, it's throughout the scriptures. My question for you this morning is, what happens? Does the Bible tell us what happens to someone that forgets that? Life gets going so fast, we forget to focus on God, and we forget to invite his control in our life. What happens when we forget to seek first the rule of God over every dimension of our life every day? Because that's the second petition of the Lord's Prayer that we're looking at. That rule of God is asking God, the one I focused on, to control me. So this morning, I'd like you to ponder, and at the end we can think about the application to our own personal lives. What happens if I can make it through a whole week of my life without ever focusing on God as my Father and then bowing in front of him and saying in this little circle where I stand, I want you to control me. So, 
this morning. You're going to need your Bible. And let's, let's look at something. Go to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's the fifth book of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The fifth book, the five books called the Pentateuch. Uh, Penta for five. But uh, it's interesting what you're looking at. Deuteronomy, right here is the reference. 429 is where I want you to get in your Bibles. But Deuteronomy, uh, do to equals second, or, or the number two, and then nomos is the word for law. So it's the second law. Now you say, that's a strange title. What are, what's going on there? Well, the first group that came out of Egypt with Moses didn't obey. They rebelled and complained and murmured and everything else and wanted to go back, and so the Lord says, none of you are going to the promised land. You're all going to drop dead one by one in this wilderness. And you're going to walk in circles and have campgrounds until every campground is filled with graves. To remind everybody that if you aren't willing to follow me, then I will not allow you to enter the promised land. So after the whole generation of adults that came out of Egypt died, the children that came out of Egypt had grown up and had their own families and they were 40 years older than at the Exodus and there is a deuteronomos, a second giving of the law by Moses to them. And look what God says in Deuteronomy 4.29. He says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with, and what does your Bible say? All your heart. And what else? All your soul. Doesn't that have a little ring to it like something Jesus said in Matthew 22? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what? All your heart and all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and your neighbors yourself. Do you remember remember the, the, the great restatement? It comes from right here. And what it is is there's something amazing. God is consistent. God from the beginning has always wanted, what does 429 say? When you seek him with all your heart. God doesn't want half-hearted devotion. God doesn't want partial ownership. God doesn't want token obedience. I mean, we can call it anything you want. God says, the only thing that I will accept is a connection that's complete. Now, do you ever, you know, plug in your digital device, your phone, or anything? Have you ever pushed in the charger but not all the way? Or maybe you're trying to jump your car, like I've had to rescue family members and start their car because they wouldn't start. And and if you put those jumper cables on but you don't carefully connect them, there is not that connection that counts and, and a half connection just sparks, but it doesn't start, or a half connection doesn't charge. The Lord says, if you don't seek me with all your heart, it doesn't count. It doesn't connect. God is amazingly consistent. Now, keep going to Psalm 19. So go to the right, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Sam, or uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. There it is. I almost lost it in my Bible. Um, it's in the middle if you can't find it uh, and you get it mixed up like me. Look at the last verse of Psalm 19. Now we come to the generation that came out that, that went through the judges and the conquest of the land, and then they had the first king who, by the way, was not having a heart for the Lord, Saul. And God says, I'm going to give all of you a king after my own heart. And, and when he presented David for anointing to be king, David was a shepherd boy, and the 19th Psalm was a psalm about growing up as a teenager out in the fields with the family flock that David was charged with. And David had a lot of time. Look, the Psalm 19 talks about him looking up at the stars. That's the first part. The heavens declare the glory of God. But look how he ends in verse 14, because this this 14th verse characterizes all our hearts being given to God. 
You know, David is the most written about person in the Bible other than God himself. 141 chapters. Why is that? God says, I want you to see how an imperfect person, that all of his struggles and everything are recorded in the Bible, how they can, in their imperfections, seek me with all their heart. How did David do that? Verse 14, let the words of my mouth, that's my public expressions, and the meditation of my heart, my private internal operating system, what, what I really am on the inside. What do I want? A consistent, an integrity between the outward broadcast and the inward meditation. Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What David was saying is that's what the fear of the Lord is. By the way, Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. David says, I don't want evil inside or outside. I want what I say and what you see me on the inside, I want it to be pleasing to you. I want a, a remarkable integrity in my life. That's David as a teenager. God saw that integrity and he said, that bingo, that's a man after my own heart who will do my will. Was David perfect? Are you kidding? He had problems with his wives, he had too many of those. Problems with his kids, he had too many of those. He didn't have one child that followed the Lord that we know about. He broke all ten commands, all of them. And yet, God had all of his heart. See, God doesn't demand perfection. He just demands that we give him our whole heart. And look at David's son. Here's Solomon. He was a half-hearted one. Uh, back up to 1 Kings, that's behind where we were to the left. 1 Kings 8, this is Solomon at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem. And look what he says in verse 48. He's talking on behalf of the Lord at the dedication of the temple, profiling the, the panorama of the future of the children of Israel, God knowing that they were going to uh, vacillate and, and go back and forth. And he says in verse 48, And when they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who led them away. What he's saying is, you guys are going to get in trouble and be taken off as captives, but when you return to the Lord with all of your heart. You see, that, that promise that's right in the middle, and you can read the whole passage at the dedication, was that God would respond to wholehearted returning. It doesn't say they didn't disobey God. It doesn't say they didn't go into captivity. It doesn't say that they weren't being chastened. But even in their chastisement, if they'll seek the Lord with all their heart, he will respond to them. Now, keep going to this one, 2 Kings 23. And I, by the way, there are scores of these. You can, you can do your own search, but I, this is just a, an idea I want you to see. But look at 2 Kings 23, and I'm just giving you appetizers. Uh, remember, I have a phonographic mind. When I say appetizers, I always remember, oh, honey, I, I shouldn't tell all my stories. I know Bonnie and I once, when I first started in ministry in California, uh, I taught about 120 people, the senior citizen class that I taught for a while. And there was a remarkably young couple in the back of the class, and they really were studious and everything, and we got to know them. And, and he was a, a businessman, and she was a politician. And, and they said, hey, you know, do you want to come to our house for dinner? Well, I mean, they were mega wealthy. And, uh, and we got to their house, and I mean, it was just unbelievable, everything crusty, uh, white, china crystal and everything. And they served us these hors d'oeuvres. And you know, the richer the food and the more expensive the restaurant, the smaller the portions and the more exotic they are. And they gave us these little plates, little plates. And I remember, you know, just putting, I was trying to be good and I just put a little bit on my plate. And those were the smallest hors d'oeuvres possible. 
And by the way, uh, it was only hors d'oeuvres for dinner that night. And I, I lamented all the way home that I didn't pile up my plate. So I'm not piling your plate. I'm only giving you hors d'oeuvres here. Look at 2 Kings 23.3. And look what the Lord says to them. The king, this is Josiah at his coronation. Already in verse 2, they have the, the book of the covenant, the Bible, the Pentateuch, the, the, and all of the, the writings of the prophets are right there. But verse 3, the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes. Look at this. With all his heart and all his soul. And, and how do you know you're full-hearted, full-souled? To perform the words of this covenant written in the book. There's something about consecration, wholeheartedness, that we want to do what God says. And so God wants all of our hearts. He wants us wholeheartedly responding to him. And then, here's the last one. Go to the right to Jeremiah, and then we'll get to the New Testament. But Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and uh, chapter 29. Now this, by the way, is the, the end of Israel. Jeremiah is the prophet presiding over the demise of Israel. And, and they already the half of the nation has been taken into captivity, the northern half, to the Assyrians. And the Assyrians have come and besieged and fought and killed all around them. And now the Babylonians are another empire is trekking toward them. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is telling the nation that they are going to be Many of them killed, all of them hauled away into captivity to be scattered for 2,600 years, scattered through the nations, and that they would never again have a kingdom that they had a king over from then on. By the way, until 1948, just a generation ago, after 2,600 years, Israel is back established as a nation. And look what Jeremiah says during this whole time while you're wandering around in captivity and persecution, homeless, the wandering Jews, starting in verse 12, then if you will call on me and go and pray to me, I will listen to you, verse 12. Now verse 13, right in the middle, that little dash right there is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God is remarkably consistent. He wants all of our heart, okay? Jesus comes to reaffirm. God's remarkable consistency through the Old Testament was, I want your heart, I want your heart, I want your heart and soul, I want your heart and soul completely devoted to me. Jesus comes as God in human flesh, And let's turn to Matthew 6, because Jesus consistently reaffirms. And that's the context. Don't just take Matthew 6 like it just drops out of like a snowflake out of the sky. It's just a remarkable, consistent message, starting with God speaking through the Old Testament and revealing himself, and then he reveals himself in human flesh as God the Son. And Christ consistently continues the Father's desire that we come with all of our heart. And, and I'll just read through these quickly. Matthew six thirty three. But seek ye first. First. That, that word describes foremost, at the front, at the top, chronologically before everything else, in priority higher foremost. That's what he wants. Seek above everything else God's rule in your life and his righteousness. So Jesus, bingo, he summarizes the Old Testament. Now look at 1037, because what he says is that when you do this, look, look what will happen. I've come to set 1037, a a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man against his enemies will be those of his own house. Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And what the Lord says is, God is on the top shelf. Everything else in life, father, mother, son, daughter, wife, everything else, career, everything else is beneath that. And it's such a quantum high shelf that everything else pales and seems like you don't even love them. 
Did you know recently we, well, it wasn't recently, a while back, we had a call come into the front office switchboard, and it was a woman saying, I'd like to speak with someone, uh, one of the pastors or something there. And so the switchboard, uh, our receptionist connected it to the pastor on call, and the person said, I have a real problem. My son goes to Western, and he was a normal son. He was a great athlete. He was a great everything. He's, he's young and handsome and popular, and he is at Western. He was just normal, going to all the parties and was involved in everything possible and just surrounded by friends, and every night he was just everywhere you could possibly be with all these parties, and just he was normal. You know, he's just drinking and partying. And the mother said, but a few months back, she says, something happened to him. She said he bought a big Bible. He kind of carries it everywhere he goes. And she says, now when I call, he's not at parties anymore. He's, he doesn't, he's not out drinking. And, and she says, all he's doing is going from small group to Bible study to class and reading his Bible and doing school. But she says he's not partying and he's not with all the girls anymore. And she says, what's happened to him? And the pastor on call says, well, I think he got saved. She says, why, he's a good Christian. He was raised in the church. And she says, but he has absolutely changed. Do you know what? That mother was offended because her son was not normal anymore. Do you know how many parents stand in the way of their children really following the Lord because the parents don't want them to have this overarching supremacy of loving the Lord their God with all their heart? They want it to be a token. They want them to just come to church when you're supposed to go to church and act, you know, good around Christian friends, but party all you want. But just, see, that's not Christianity. Christianity is the radical transformation that makes everything else. Verse 37, if you love your father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. I am supreme. Now go to Luke 9, 23. By the way, can you believe Jesus said all this? And, and as he was saying it, the crowds were going like this in, in attendance. It got toward, by the time we get to, to the middle of Luke, it says the people were trampling trampling and tromping on each other because there was such immense, in fact, the scriptures use three different levels. First, there were big crowds. Then there were massive crowds. Then there were uncountable crowds. There are three different levels that the gospels record. What I wonder is, were they listening? Because finally, the crest of Christ's ministry is in John chapter 6. And Jesus looked at them and said, you can't be my disciple if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood. In other words, you have, to, you have to partake of me. This is not association, it's personal. And in that context, look at Luke 9. Because this is what Jesus was saying. Luke 9, whoop, let me turn the page to 23. And he said to them all, this is when the crowds are crawling on each other. If you want to come after me, you all are here for the meal. But if you want to keep coming after me, let him deny himself. You have to renounce yourself. See, we were all born with self at the top of our list. And God was, you know, when needed, you know, if needed. And we piled in everything in between. And God says, you must renounce that and if you want to really follow me, verse 23, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, which means you've got you to resist the constant desire to get back at the top of the list and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life. We were all born wanting to save and hold on to our pile of stuff that we had piled up. And God was down there, but, you know, distant. But he says, if you renounce yourself and follow me, you will, you will, if you just try and save your life, you'll lose it, verse 24 says. But if you lose your life, if you say, what we just sang, Alleluia, all I have is Christ. He's up here. Oh, come on, stop that. 
See, even this is an unsaved screen. <laughs> it didn't like that. It was blacking it out. It didn't want to give up. If, if we want Christ, look, look what it says. If you lose your life, if you, if you say, I count it all but loss for Christ's sake, you'll save it. For what profit is it to a man, verse 25, if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Keep going to 14. It says the same thing. Uh, turn over Luke 14, uh, starting verse 26. He kind of repeats, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and has his mom calling the church office and saying, what's wrong with my child and his uh, wife and children and brothers and sisters? Yes, in his own life, he can't be my disciple. That's, did you know people by chapter 14, they were standing out there and they went, what did he just say? And the crowds diminished. And it says in John 6, 66, that most of his followers stop, stopped following him. They started finally hearing what he was asking for. Verse 27, who, he who doesn't bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Look at verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has. This is not the vow of chastity, poverty, and whatever. This is Christianity presented by Jesus Christ. Disciple equals being saved. We already covered that many months ago. Every instance, disciples were those who were following and learning from Christ. He said, if you want to be born again, you have got to respond to my call and continue seeking me to be first. And, and we could go through this, but the bottom line how we got to this is Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come is me asking God in the circle where I stand to control me. And control me is defined in the rest of the Bible. Let, let me show you. Back up to, to Matthew 6, and, and I'm going to rapidly go through these because they're all... Uh, they're all clearly described if we neglect them what will happen and so that's why I want to show you quickly you probably know Matthew 6 talks about put your treasures in verse 19 Matthew 6 19 says this don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust decay uh, and where thieves break in and steal so look at this either I ask the Lord to control my treasures or they'll get stolen you say, what do you mean stolen? Well, if nothing else, pried out of your hands at death, right? You can't take it with you. No one ever has. No one ever will. You can send it ahead. You can't take it with you. If I don't give the control of my treasures to the Lord, they will get stolen. Either thieves will come or they'll get rusted or moth-eaten or they'll just get pried out of my rigor morticized hands by probate court or my relatives. You know what I mean? See, either we submit all that we have to his control or we lose it. Now, keep going. Uh, look at Romans 12. This is Paul. By the way, the disciples got this. Did you know that every one of the themes of, of the Lord's Prayer, the focus on God and worshiping him, the, his consecration, control me, his guidance, you know, lead me, the provision, pray for his provision, protect me, the spiritual warfare, every one of those themes of the Lord's Prayer are woven through the epistles. Here's this one, the consecration one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, by the mercies of God, that you present your what? What does your Bible say? Ah, that's me saying, Lord, control my body. If not, if I don't let the Lord control my body, then I will not be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What does that mean? I'll waste my life. I'll end up being at the other end of life. The end, the, the no time left. The time when everyone's whispering. You notice they're all around you whispering in the hospital room. You know something's happening. And I will look back at my life 
and I will think, what, what do I have for my life? A whole pile of concert tickets and movie tickets and, and trinkets. I mean, do you ever go into ICU and see people sitting there with, with all their trophies? I mean, I've been doing this 37 years. I've been with many people as they died. I never saw anybody laying in bed hugging their trophies. I never saw anybody there laying with all their stock certificates, you know. I, I never saw them all holding tightly their 50-year gold watch, their Rolex that they got for 50 years at the corporation. Do you know the only thing they're holding on to? People they love. Did you know the Lord says, you'll get to the end of life and it will be wasted living if you don't say, I want to present my body back for your control. Here's another thing he said. My motivations, as you hold my body. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Uh, what's amazing is the Lord says, uh, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were bought so you can glorify God in your body. My motivation for life that I want God con to control is that I want to glorify God. And if I don't acknowledge he bought me for a purpose, then my way in life will be tainted by self-interest and I'm not glorifying God. See, my motivation for life has to be uh, 6, 19, and 20, bought at a price, verse 20, glorify God. That's my motivation. I was bought, I want to glorify. If I, the only way I can do that is to keep stepping into that circle of surrender and saying, God, control my motives so I can glorify you. Here's another one, uh, 2 Corinthians 10. And boy, I think this is a real challenge because uh, the Lord says everything spiritually comes from our minds. That is the spiritual realm. And the only way that, that it operates correctly is to not allow our minds to be all over the place, but to be under the control. Our thoughts have to be under the control of Christ. And, and look what it says in verse 5. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity. Thoughts controlled. If I don't have my thoughts controlled, James says that I'm double-minded, dipsukas. I have two operating systems, and I'm unstable in all my ways, and I'm like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. It's just like whichever the way the wind's blowing, and did you know that's how so many people are? They're just trampling uh, or, or going like a herd toward whatever the newest thing is. They, they are not captivated by Christ, they're going with the crowd. And if the crowd's all doing this, they're doing it too. And they don't even know why. They just are going with the crowd. And there's, see that, I just think that, that woman shocked that her son is such a graphic, she said, everything that he used to live for, he's, he's not even interested anymore. Really? I mean, kind of. She said he still plays sports and he's still really good. But it isn't what he's living for. His thoughts are under Christ's control. Here's another one that's amazing. Galatians 2.20, every day of my life, I am crucified with Christ, but I still live. Yet it's not I, but Christ living in me. And look at what 2.20 says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All of a sudden, my life is lived differently. My days, each one of them, are under his control. Why? Because if I don't, they get frittered away. Uh, one of my kids, uh, I remember once they used to uh, be a waiter at a restaurant, and you know, high tip restaurant where they'd all go home with their pockets packed with money uh, from these high end restaurants. And, and, and he would come home and he would dutifully count it out and have me deposit it for him. And on Monday, he'd go back to work, and he'd say, all those other waiters and waitresses would say, man, I don't even know what happened to all my money over the weekend. You know, I went to so many parties and, you know, the bars and everything else, and I spent it all. Did you know if you don't get one day at a time under Christ's control, they'll just get frittered away like a waiter or waitress's pocket full of money if they don't put it in the bank, the control 
of Christ, and that's the, the crucified life. How about my emotions? Look at Galatians. Now, this is fascinating, and this is something that's so practical. Galatians 5.22, actually, the thought starts in verse 16 of chapter 5, and it says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's two elements here. There's the Spirit prompted, and there's the flesh prompted. And if I want my emotions under the Spirit's power, then I will look like verse 22. I will have love and joy and peace. But if I don't have love, if I'm selfish, that means that emotion has not been surrendered to the control of the Spirit, and it's under the flesh. And what happens is my, my emotions become fleshly. What do fleshly emotions look like? Verse 21, they're envious. And uh, verse uh, 20, they're there's hatred and contentions and jealousies and outbursts of wrath and selfish dissension, heresies, and all the bad stuff in verse 19. Either I surrender and seek the control of my emotions by Christ, or I operate in the flesh. And that's every time I say control me. Uh, Ephesians 5.16, either I can say control my time, Lord. It's running by me like a river at 60 minutes an hour. I want that time to be redeemed. Redeeming the time, knowing the days are evil, is what Ephesians 5.16 says. I can say, Lord, I give this day, this time to you. And that time is instantly redeemed for eternity. It's lifted out of that river going by, and I'm saying, Lord, control my time today. And if I get off kilter, bring me back. Remember, David was so imperfect, but yet his heart was complete. Uh, here, oh, this is one of the most dangerous ones. Do you know what Philippians 4, 8 says? It's about what we're supposed to think about. Whatever things are, does anybody know the verse? Whatsoever things are what? True, what else? Uh, yeah, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, on and on it goes. What was that first one? True. What is the first imperative of what we put into our minds? Truth. What is the new generation primarily feasting their minds on? Not truth. Many young people live in an imaginary world. Gaming is not true. It's imaginary. It's not just, it's not pure. It's certainly not lovely. And it's not of good report to God. And the Lord says, either you surrender what's coming into your mind by the filter that he has set up to only let in true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and good reports, and if there's any virtue, if any phrase, think on those things, or else my mind will become what? Contaminated. I used to work at Bill Knapp's, and I remember they had a rule that you could have the most expensive steak, and if that thing fell on the ground, you, you couldn't look two ways and put it on the plate. It was contaminated. Yet, we allow the most precious, delicate piece of hardware in the universe, our minds, to be contaminated by choice with 60-foot wide, 30-foot high Dolby surround screens. And we're looking at things that are not true, they're not just, they're not pure, they're not lovely, they're not of good report, especially to God. And God says, either I control your mind or your mind gets contaminated. And basically, Jesus came down and taught this, then he commissioned the disciples, then he encouraged them as they planted the church, and then he comes back at the end, and look what he says. The last, look at 1 John 5, and we have one minute before we have to go. Go to 1 John 5, and this is where I'm going to end. Look at the last thing that the Apostle John in his, his little epistles to the, to the church says in 521. Little children, beware of drifting away from seeking God first. What happens if we do that? We have to beware of anything becoming an idol. What is an idol? An idol is anything that gets foremost in our life. And the Bible tells us many things can 
rob God of being foremost. So little children, beware of idols. What are the idols he thought about? He knew the Old Testament. Job says, watch out that you don't worship gold. You sit around and, like the man I told you about last week that carries his gold back and forth. Money can become an idol. Career or technology, Habakkuk talked about how fishermen would worship their net because it could get fish out of the water. Instead of worshiping the God that made the fish and gave them strength to fish, they worshiped the net. That's as ridiculous and unwise as worshiping your career. It's only God that gives us brain waves to continue in breath to work. Or we worship technology. We just love technology instead of the God that designed the laws of the universe that makes the technology work. And those things can become an idol, and God begins to slip. And whenever anything is more important than the Lord, it's an idol. And we also need to be aware of our appetites. It says in Philippians 3.19, whose God is their appetite. They just live for whatever they want. And then... Here's the worst one. Beware of the idol of distraction and just empty living. Love not the world. You know what God says? The crowd is embodied by the world. And if you love what the crowd loves, what the Broadway, what the majority, what, what all of culture is going toward, if you love that, he says, don't love that. Because if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that's in the world is in the arms of the evil one. And, and we have to say, God you're foremost, and I want your control. And when you control my body and my mind and my time and my treasures and my motivations and my emotions and everything else, then I'm going to seek you first. And you're going to be my master, and I'm going to follow you through life. And so what the Lord said is, when Christ examined some of the early believers' lives, he states that they need to seek him foremost. Now, before we go, I want to ask you this. Do you think that God is consistently saying we're supposed to seek him with all of our heart and with all of our soul? Do you think that's true? Say, say something out loud. Yes. Now, here's the big question. What are you going to do about it? Let's all stand. And as you stand, I want you to think about where you're standing. In fact, for a minute, if I could give all of you a piece of chalk and you could draw a circle where you're standing, think about standing in a circle right now. And as I close in prayer, you know what would be neat to do? To say, Lord, I'd like you to control what's inside this little circle where I stand. And I want to start every day focusing on who you are and then responding to your desire to control me. Can you imagine what will happen in your family? I'm going to have a lot of mothers call me this week. That's how radical Christ can change us. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As we stand before you, Father, we follow Christ's desire. And each one of us from our hearts that truly wish to say this, are saying to you, control me. I want to seek your rule in my life over my time and my body and my emotions, my time usage. I want you foremost. Show me what that means. I surrender to you. I pray you do that in our lives today. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. And God bless you as you go.